Well, it's always a pleasure to do this. It's one of my favorite things to do. And as uh, Jeff had said, I spent 25 years, I was born and raised on a dairy farm, but then spent 25 years in veterinary practice. And through that phase, a lot of what had happened in southwestern Ontario was quite a shift in our client base as, as new Dutch immigrants came into really that second wave between 88 to 94. And I got involved, as luck would happen, I got to work with a lot of really good producers, but I got an opportunity to get involved with setting up those farms, structuring them, and even working on, on uh, securing financing through creditors or financial institution. So it cut my teeth and realized that I had a lot to learn about business. And I did go back and complete an MBA. And then I spent uh, a number of years with Pfizer Animal Health, ran their Canadian uh, cattle and equine and genomics business before I joined BioAgrimix as CEO. It's interesting when you look at it. And we are, and I know Jeff said this earlier today, we are all in business. There's no doubt about it. And we need to treat it like a business. And it is a wonderful lifestyle. And there are changes. I always caution people, quit debating the things we don't know and spend our time focusing on the things we do know. And I'll show you some numbers here, financially, how the dairy industry sh shapes out and what the difference is. You're actually very fortunate because the supply managed sector for dairy is not like supply managed, for example, the feather business. And I say that, the feather business, the birds are the same, the barn's the same, the feed's the same. There's very little opportunity to differentiate yourself within that sector. It's not true in dairy. And when we start looking at dairies and tearing them apart and really seeing good from bad and, and understanding what good looks like, there's lots of opportunity in this business. So I'll start with that and then we'll go through. And I'm going to talk about strategic planning and we need a bit of a definition. This looks pretty long-winded. But we should go through it. It's a pattern or a plan, and you've heard about having plans. It integrates an organization's major goals, policies, and action sequences into a cohesive whole. A well-formulated strategy helps to marshal and allocate an organization's resources. And we're going to talk a lot about this, about resource asset optimization within dairy farms into a unique and viable posture based on its relative internal competencies. So what are you good at? And shortcomings, because as Jeff said, we're not good at everything. We should understand that. Anticipated changes in the environment. And nothing's new here, folks. I mean, I've been in practice in the dairy industry a long time. 1982, supply management was going to be gone. And it didn't happen. And I tell you that you cannot sit here and think about things that may or may not happen in the future. We've got real pressures on the business today and I'm going to talk about structural surplus and what that means and how that's happening to you. But that's real. And then contingent moves by intelligent opponents. Start thinking about that because we have to start, as Jeff said earlier today, with an end in mind. We have to have a pretty clear understanding where the industry is going and how we're going to position ourselves within it. So. Nothing to do with agriculture here. Let's just talk about some basic business strategies. And there are some that really get fairly clear quickly. And, and so you can be a low cost, you can be differentiated, and you can be in a niche market. And I put a couple of examples in here, and this is what goes on in Ontario, which is DHA enhanced or omega-3 enhanced milk. Obviously organic is clearly in a niche market and low cost and I put answers up here, and I shouldn't have done that, because for the majority of you, where should your strategic direction be? Any guesses when you look at those three? What is it strategically that you can do with your operation to survive in the future? Lower your cost. For the majority of people, there's good things in supply management, and there's bad things in supply management. Unfortunately, supply management has insulated you from the farm gate out. Insulated or, or you've lost some opportunity, as you were discussing before, is who is your customer and how does that really translate to what we can do on the farm? We're going to talk a lot today from the farm gate in because, quite honestly, there's not very much we can do in this room today from the farm gate out. But there are good things in supply management as well. And, you know, I, my father was one that fought for it in 1965, but the world's changed. At that point in 1965, there was 52,000 dairy producers in Canada, and there was over 1,300 processors. 
And one of the fundamentals about supply management at that time was getting price equalization and fairness across the industry. And it did do that. Now, we can get into discussions about quota and the, the balance sheet impact. As you know, quota resided as an off-balance sheet item for a long time, but it's such a big asset on a dairy farm, we have to start thinking about it. And so differentiating yourself and these strategies, they are truly customer-based strategies, i.e. they only work if your customer cares and is willing to pay the difference. So you really need to know your customer base. But I'm going to tell you why you can't mix and match these is low cost is competition-based competition strategy. And as much as you don't want to hear this, you're all in competition here. So you need to know what good looks like and how good some producers are at putting up milk. And we'll talk about this is, this is all businesses. We, we fight with this in every business I'm in. To do nothing is called stuck in the middle or try to be all things to all people. It's, it's broke several large companies or almost ended them. It will sure as heck break you. So you got to decide what you're going to do. I will tell you, whether you consciously do this or not, the decisions you make on a daily basis lead to what they call emergent strategies. How you deploy capital, how you use your assets on farm will get you one of these strategies, whether you do it or not. I'm just telling you to be delivered about it and understand what it is you're asking for when you look to the future. Now these things change, and every good business has a living or an evergreen strategic plan. Things change over time, and you've got to be adaptable to change. And I'm going to show you some data here done on Canadian farms on profitability from a management perspective, who's winning and who's losing. So, you were correct. For the majority of people, from the farm gate in, you need to learn how to produce in a low-cost production strategy. Number one, the biggest mistake made in low-cost production strategies is the belief that the way to do it is control input costs. That is absolutely wrong. And I can just tell you, feed costs. You want to control feed costs? Don't buy any feed. Now, how many think that's a very good strategy? But it's a big number on a dairy farm. But it's crazy, isn't it? You just don't get any production. So we have to start thinking about producing quality products. Now, I will tell you, and Jeff talked about, about this this morning, it is important to live a low-cost culture, i.e., the strategic plan that you have you must communicate with everyone. I'm talking with your employee base. I'm talking, I've got into family farms where the, you know, the senior person in the operation didn't think like the younger next generation coming on board. No communication. Completely misaligned on where they were going. And that is not good. The other thing is, is you need to build yourself a team around that's aligned with what you're trying to do. Don't be afraid to communicate what it is you're trying to accomplish. So you've got to live a low-cost culture. I should underline this one. You need to invest or adopt technologies that either lower your cost or increase your revenue. If they don't do that, I have no idea why you would invest in them. And we'll talk about the fads you get hit with, and we're going to talk about adoption curves and technology curves and what they mean. You need to have excellent asset utilization. So what are the big assets on a dairy farm? Quote is one. Anybody else? Any others? Yeah, your barn, your, what I call the physical plant. So the physical plant is land base and, and your facilities, absolutely. Anything else? We missed a biggie. Cows. Did you say cows? You win. Yeah. <laughs> Cattle are the other big one. We need to optimize them. So when you start thinking about your, bar, your business that way, that I've got those assets and I want to optimize them, how would I do that? Economy of scale is important particularly as some technologies come along that are not economy of scale neutral, i.e. cow-based neutral. So the cost of putting some technologies on farm today, if you're milking 50 cows versus 400 cows, is different. Now, if you have per cow-based technologies that you can adopt, you don't win on those. But most technologies coming along are not, are not neutral on a cow-based number. You need to know what their competition, you need to know what good looks like, and then you need to set goals. 
And I'm going to talk to you about some goals from a financial perspective. We're really good at setting goals from a production standpoint. And I will tell you, technically on producing milk, we're actually pretty good. Where the range really starts to come is when we start looking at financial numbers. You have to be adaptable to change. And this is going to be a tough one for this, and I will share this with people. Having been involved with a lot of dairy farms, they were technically great at looking after cows and technically terrible at looking after people. And your world changed. As farms get larger, you have to start looking at human resources as an asset, not as an expense. And how you manage them, yeah, and I see people going, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, we don't run an adult daycare. We have to start thinking about how we manage and motivate people and get them aligned. So let's go on. So what do you think the key drivers of dairy profitability are? You're all in the business, yes? Production. When you say production, what do you mean by that? Help me out here. I'm new. Yeah, so return over feed, pretty good number. Anybody else? Reproductive performance, yeah, keep going. We're going to get to this, by the way. You're nailing them, as I knew you would, because you're all producers. You understand that. Pardon? Yeah, price of milk is one. You may not have, you can do it within your components and optimizing it, but you can't do anything else past that. So. Component optimization can be one. Now I'm going to back you up and I'm going to tell you something. Everything you've told me is what I call an output variable. There are outputs of the decisions you make. I'm going to talk you back now and I said we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at it from an input. How do you wake up and think in the morning? That's what drives those results you're talking about. So I will tell you input variables are your managerial skills. And I'm going to show you the data that shows you why that's so important. When I say from a managerial standpoint, you have to be able to develop a team. This is a complicated business. You have to know how to manage labor, and you have to know how to deploy capital, i.e. asset utilization. I'm going to put this into financial terms for you eventually, but that's simple. You have to be good at technology adoption. I told you, these are the underpinnings of low-cost cultures. You need to know when to adopt technologies. You've got to be pretty good at separating fads from ROI. What do I mean by ROI investments? Exactly. I told you before, if it's not either lowering your costs or increasing your revenue, changing your profit margin, I have a hard time understanding how it gets on farm. But it happens all the time. So you've got to get good at separating fads from these items. And there are type 1 and type 2 errors on making decisions. There are decisions out there that have been so well documented and proven and the upside on potential on that so strong and yet they're not 100% adopted. I'd have to ask you why that is. It's, it's, you should be doing it. Type 2 errors are actually a little tougher because they may have high capital input costs. You're not sure how they're going to work for you. And there's a lot of unknowns around them. But the type 1 errors they should be done. And I can give you some examples for, ex well, I'll ask you, I did, I did this in Lacoma, I'll ask the same question. So, how much colostrum should a calf get and how quickly? <coughs> Eight liters in 24 hours, certainly four in four. So four liters in four hours, correct. And if you do four in four, the other four don't matter, unfortunately, doesn't matter. But the right answer, it's just the first four in four is the critical ones. How often do you think that happens? <laughs> yeah. See what I'm going on? Do you know what that means to first lactation production? Four and four? Anybody want to take a shot at it? How much milk does that mean when she calves out as a two-year-old, as a heifer? Pardon? That is correct. Would you make that investment? And I'm going to show you why it's important, because I'll show you what lifetime milk versus first lactation production looks like, and you're darn right you would. And yet we know, as much as we talk technically about this, we know the things we should be doing, and I'll talk a bit about knowing doing gaps. We don't always get it done. The last thing I'm going to say is resource optimization. You've been through that. You just gave me the re right resources. You've got livestock quota, and I say land-based, but I'm talking physical plant. You've got them. You know what they are. We have to learn how to optimize them. And the last one that shows up here 
as an asset on, on low cost structure is people optimization. How do you hire, how do you train, how do you motivate, and how do you align people? It's probably, from a management perspective in my years, it's probably one of the toughest things to do. You'd think we'd be really good at it, eh? I mean, we can interact with people every day. We get along just fine. Try and manage them and get them aligned behind a common cause, it's a different thing. Partially because we don't communicate very well. So, why does this matter? Just published. Done by Ipsos Reed, done on Canadian farms, 604 farms across Canada, representing all farm type sizes and farmer ages. They tried to find if there was a differentiator on what led to financial success. The good news, none of that mattered. A little bit, and you'll, you'll get to the bottom and you'll understand why when I get there. Most important criteria for driving farm income was continuous learning and adaptability to change. Now you're already in the right segment because you're here today. You actually care, I don't think you came for the lunch, but maybe you did, but you actually care enough about your business that you're willing to invest your time, and time is an important asset to come and try and learn. And I hope you do learn something, but you've already made that conscious decision, and you have to be adaptable to change. So what difference did it make? So the top quartile, the top 25%, had a 525% increase in return on assets over the bottom 25%. Huge. I'm telling you, your management skills matter. Huge difference. 100% change on return on equity and asset turnover. And I'm going to tell you why that's so important when we get to it. Asset turnover is another way of saying asset utilization. And 105% increase in gross margin. Let's back up here. There was no difference based on farm type. Whether you were within supply managed or not, there was no difference in whether you had an off-farm income, but there was a slight bias towards larger farms. That study is available if you want it. You can look at it. It was done by Ipsos Reed. Why do you think there was a slight bias towards larger farms? You got her. It's that simple. So when we understand that now, you're doing the right thing by investing in your management skills. And you have to be adaptable to change, and you have to decide what your future is going to look like. So managerial skills. Don't be afraid to invest in yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. Develop a team that is aligned behind your business goals. Try to understand a little bit more about labor management and what makes people tick. I will tell you, a happy, they're not unlike cows, by the way. The good news is people are not unlike cows. Happy, motivated, and aligned people are a great workforce. If they're not doing those, they become a real problem. And they have to live within your quality culture. I didn't really harp on that enough within a low-cost strategy, but high quality is, underpins low-cost strategy. And I give you a bit of an example on that, and, and I was talking to Jeff about this a little earlier. If you start looking at milk produced versus milk shipped out the driveway, there's a huge difference between farms. All your costs are associated with milk produced, and all your revenue is associated with milk out the driveway. And too many farms <coughs> dump too much milk into their liquid manure systems. And it's interesting when you really start looking at it, it often gets missed. I've seen farms only shipping 85% of what they produce, and I've seen farms shipping 94%. Now, you're not, not going to get to 100, but set yourself a goal and understand how you get there is important, and that's all about producing quality. Capital utilization. From a managerial perspective, you better be pretty good at deploying capital. Leverage is a wonderful thing if it works for you. And what do you, you know what I mean by leverage? I mean, how many in this room, if you can borrow money at 3% and make 10%, how much money should you borrow? As much as you could get, exactly. The situation we're in, and I could show you, yes? I'm going to disagree with you. Yeah? I'm going to say as much as you can sleep with. Well, we're going to talk about that. And why is that? Do you believe interest, do you believe interest rates are going to stay where they are? Which way are they going? Up. There's no upward, yeah, they can't go down. So, yeah. There is, you know, people talk about the Bank of Canada is going to give a negative interest rate. Do you know what they mean by that? Just to wander off onto another topic. Well, of course, banks put their money into reserve with the Bank of Canada. They're going to make it a negative interest rate so banks don't do that, so they get out and deploy the money into the 
to drive economy. That's what that's about. But for you, interest rates only have one way to go. If you like looking at stats, over the last 200 years, average interest floats between 4 and 6%. Now you can put, all, like I say, it's a bit of a gamble. That's what we're talking about, you're bringing up, is the risk. So we can go all in. We can expand, we can make our bet, we can leverage ourselves to the hilt, but I'm just telling you, be careful and put the, the bias around it, which is what would happen to me if interest rates rose to 6%? What would I look like? So leverage your debt correctly, and I will tell you, they're not always structured right on dairy farms. We do, a, farms in general do this. We go out and we buy an asset. Oh, well, we'll start another loan. And I've seen, I've got involved in some farms, they got 15 different loans. No structure to what their debt looked like, no understanding about what it should be, what is the debt restructure, and some of it has to do on what I call depreciated assets, and I'm not talking the, the depreciation that goes on on your balance sheet and the expense item on that. I'm talking about things wear out on farm, and you've got to get yourself into a position where you can replace them. And a big one is, is of course, when you build capital assets like new barns. How many today would build a barn today like they would have 20 years ago? How many? No one. So why do we build them to last 30 or 40 years? And I try to structure them. When I do new assets, new barns, they're 15 year amortization periods. I want to get myself into position so I can adopt the next technology when it comes along. But I will tell you, when you make a decision, and in volatile markets, let's talk about this, when you make your decision to go all in and make your bet, you are locked out, because we only all have access to so much capital. You're locked out from making a decision to go after more money until you pay that debt down. And for most dairy farms, you're five years before you can make another decision. So the timing on making decisions becomes important. Now that's good news for you, because volatility creates opportunity. You may not like it, but it's actually a good thing for businesses sometimes. So. Lots of people want to come here and hit you with information. This is true of all of us now. We are, we are in an information age. We get bombarded with information. But I'm telling you, and it was talk, Jeff talked about it a bit this morning, if you're not going to use that information to actually make a decision, quit doing it. You don't have to do that. But I will give you a difference between what I call data information and knowledge. So data to me, on a, I'll give you a good example. Bulk milk somatic cell count. What do you do with that? How many track it? Yeah. And, and what, what decisions do you make off it? Yeah. What's going on? Something's going on in the herd. Yeah. But you can't, it's hard to make decisions off a of bulk tank somatic cell count. But if you had individual cow data, whoo. Yeah, if I had individual cow data or I had some sort of a tracking mechanism, now I know who caused it, yeah. what stage of lactation, are they chronically high, are there spikes, environmental spikes, all those things. And again, that's bulk tank somatic cell count is data, individual cow somatic cell counts are information, still useless unless you're going to make a management decision out of it. Still crazy. So if you want to make a change, then make a decision and use it and transform that into a management decision. You will be light years ahead. There's so much information for you to categorize, and I'm going to talk about the complexity of, of dairy production. The good news is it's the most complex livestock production model there is. That's good news to everybody in this room, because every time you get complexity into a business, it allows the cream to rise to the top. You just want to play this game in the top quartile and you'll be just fine. I don't care what happens beyond your farm gate. And I can show you some stats about why that would be important. So you need a good team. The other thing is, is we're all waiting in business for the next new evolutionary change. That's going to make us great. Success doesn't come from that. It comes from doing what we already know how to do but don't get done on a daily basis. It's not, the, it's not for dairy farmers, it's for every business. We just don't get things done that we know we should be doing. They're called knowing doing gaps. They kill businesses. They really take away from the bottom line. But I will tell you, we're moving beyond the technical expertise era into the managerial era. And a part of that is, is because the attrition rate in dairy farms, in all farms. The good have survived, 
And the good have survived because they've been getting better technically. Now I'm going to tell you, as soon as everybody's good technically, what differentiate you from your neighbor? Because we're in a competition here. What do you think it is now? Now it becomes your managerial expertise, and that's the era we're heading into. And that's what will create sustainable advantage. So, again, I'm going to tell you, let's talk about technology adoption. It's not related to your business. This data is sound. It's been tested in multiple businesses. Everybody wants to keep doing Woo, that's a complex slide. We'll get there. Everybody is resistant to change. That's fairly normal. Some of us like it better than others, but most people say, I just like to do today what I did yesterday, and I'll get along. I'm going to tell you that won't work in this environment. Now, when you had looked at new technologies, generally, the early adopters, we call them the bleeding edge, on average they lose. The first two and a half percent into new technologies actually lose. Why do you think that is? Yeah, because it hasn't been proven yet. But we need them. By the way, encourage your neighbors to be in that group. <laughs> we do need them because those are the ones that start these and looks at things and finds out whether they can be deployed across everybody and be big winners. Note this, though. The next 12.5% in are big winners. If you're last to jump on board, you are a big loser, loser, and that's particularly true in supply management. Anybody want to hazard a guess why? What the technologies that you would adopt? I already gave you the answer earlier on. What do they do? Yeah, they change your cost structure. They either lower your cost or raise your revenue. You do one of those. Those are what make them true, and that's where adoption comes in. What happens in supply management when that comes along? It doesn't happen in Ontario anymore, but it sure happens here. Pardon? Exactly. It gets recapitalized back into the price of quota instantly. If people can pay more quota for quota because their cost structure allowed it, they will, and quota price jumps. So if you're the last to jump on board, you're jumping in, and that productivity is lost in your quota purchases. And that continues to go on on farms. We keep relocating cows and quota all the time. So the, it happens to all farms, by the way. Most farms, traditional agriculture, it happens within land base. Except land base doesn't trade every month. If there's a huge increase in profitability, you'll watch land prices go up. So that's important. But you're faced with this. You've got an onslaught of things that people telling you you should do, and you're standing there going, rightfully so, how do I know it'll work for me? So that's where you've got to get some help on deciding, if I do this, if I make this decision, what will the future look like? You've got to get pretty good at modeling once you set your strategy. Because here's what goes on. When new technologies come along, there are these big things called marketing departments, and they create hype. Of course they do, that's their job. Here's your early, that says pilots here, but those are early adopters, bleeding edge. They take on those and if it doesn't work out, boom, it's gone again and you see them disappear. If it actually works and it changes profit margins, then you will see rollouts and you'll start to see big adoption. And this is, the adoption curve started to ramp up. And here it is down here, which is at this point, you're too late, you can't be successful without it but there's nothing left in it for you. It happens to all businesses. So you've got to get good at knowing what to adopt and when to adopt them. Financial levers. We all like to complicate it. There's only three. There's only three. I can jimmy around with my profit margin. I can look at my asset turnover, my asset utilization, and then I can leverage myself. Be that equity or debt burden leverage. All companies are all the same. Those are the three levers we get to pull. Now, if you multiply those three levers together, P times A times T, you come up with return on equity. That's what it is. How many know the return on equity? Sad, isn't it? It's always the same. And I'm telling you, it's the biggest single measure of all your financial levers. And yet we wouldn't know it. You're not different than any other farm. It's always the same way. We've got to start understanding that, and I realize financials are outcomes of all those decisions we make, but we should see whether we're winning or losing. And there's an easy way to do it is 
Yeah, you have to. How, run, how many run a cash accounting and an accrual accounting system? The accrual one's the one that matters. I'm looking over here at Myers Norris Penny, what are you do two sets of books for your farms, or are you doing <laughs> just one? Okay. <laughs> one is often created for tax purposes, and one created because you can't cash account as a farmer. But, but so an accrual base. So you've got to take your net income divided by your equity in there, and it's widely variable. I told you in that slide earlier on with farms. Uh, guess what? There was a 500% difference between good farms and bad farms. So here's what's going on in Alberta. So this is the latest data from Stats Canada. It's old, and I'm going to show you some new data, but the next slide, of course, is going to be Ontario because I have the Ontario Dairy Farm Accounting Project. What you will see, though, is net worth, i.e. equity, and your income, your net cash farm income, your return on equity is actually sliding. Why is that? Supply manage, we should be able to manage that. Why do you think you can't keep up? Why can your revenue not stay ahead of your expenses? And I'll fast forward, I'll show you the data from Ontario going right through to 2014. Here's revenue, here's expenses, here's margin, net farm income, and it's dropping. So return on equity is dropping. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, but your net farm revenue isn't. No. Now that won't sh show here. Because you've got a problem already. Forget talking about trade agreements. Non -structure, the structural surplus in this country is hurting you guys. It's hurting you big time. There's lots of ways. You can fractionate milk into lots of components and bring it across the border duty-free. Just take a milk protein isolate from the U.S., over 85% protein, she comes across the border, no fee. So you're under the pressure of what's going on in the world right now. That's okay, though. I'm still saying you can manage and survive. Don't go home feeling bad about this. Go home thinking about how I'm going to manage it. That's what's going on in supply management right now. Our ability to raise milk price to offset expenses isn't the same as it used to be. Everybody knows that. So, does your cost structure matter? And this is older, but I put it up because, you know what, I'm going to teach you some cost curves here, and it doesn't really matter. This is a farm that came to me. They were milking 60 cows. They had 8,500 liters. This is back when milk, net and milk price was 71 cents, so it's a, some time ago. They had low fixed costs. Virtually no debt. When I say fixed costs, this was bank, cost of living, insurance, property taxes. We're all loaded in there. Their question to me was, should I borrow a whole swat of money, build a new barn, go up to 100 cows, we think we can get to this production level, but we got to borrow money, and our financial structure would mean we'd be putting 35 cents a liter into, so half of my money now is going into fixed costs. Well, the rule is, yes, you can do that as long as you drop your variable costs. This farm had high variable costs, not unlike. They can't adopt technologies. They weren't, I can tell you, this was a component-fed herd. It didn't have a TMR. All those things got looked at that changed your cost structure. So their variable costs would have gone to there. Break even was 6,500 liters here. It would have been 7,600 liters here. Which one structured better for the future? Back to your thing about risk. We need to balance, we need to know how to assess it though. Which one's better? Given what I've just shown you is going on in the world. Why? Was well, the right answer, by the way. You had a 50% chance, but why? <laughs> Pardon? You got her. Because they drop variable costs. And when you map that into a cost curve, there's what they look like. This was growing and this is staying where they were. When every dollar you earn is sucked up in your variable cost, and we know milk production continues to climb at about 1%, 1.1% per cow per year, but if it all goes out in variable costs, as incrementally you move up, you don't gain very much. They're called flat cost curves. If I invest and lower my variable costs, I get a steeper cost curve. You were right. So fast forward. Where's the future? I just told you. Profit margins are declining. declining. Move at 15%, this guy's out of business. Farms don't realize that's what happens to them. You don't invest, 
You don't learn how to lower your variable cost of production. You got great balance sheets. You get into cash flow problem and you exit the business. It's that simple. Just recognize if that's that's okay actually if that's the choice you wanted to make. But if you don't, you better get pretty good at lowering your variable costs and ramp your cost curves up. You'll survive. But there's a wide variation around variable costs, unfortunately, on farms. Huge variation on dairy farms. So profit margin, how do I impact it? Well, I invest in things that increase revenue or lower costs. That's a no-brainer. I set goals, though. Now I start setting some financial goals. And I got involved in several farms throughout my career that, you know, I call them check writers. They get to the end of the month, start writing checks, and hope there was enough money to cover it. But you can't manage businesses like that. You've got to set some goals on where you're going to put your money and what you expend to, to uh, expense things on. It is a complex model. But that's good news to everybody in this room because complex models means there's wide ranges within it and you can advantage yourself. There's a combination of, as you know, production, financial, and efficiency parameters, but then you're in four businesses. Yeah, you're in milk production, you're in the crop business, the majority of people. You're in the replacement business and you're in the cattle sales. You either sell them or drag them off dead. It's one or the other, but you are in cattle do leave farms. How they leave farms, I'm going to show you, is dramatically important to you. I'm telling you, most people, we'll back up here. Most people don't mess up all four, but they're not very good in some areas. And unfortunately, the way your records are built, you can't segregate out where you're good and where you're bad. So there is advantage in trying to separate out your production and your financials on an enterprise basis to take a look at it. And I'll go back to, does anybody know how Walmart was built, how Sam Walton built it? He started out with a single hardware store. He ran one separate set of books for every four foot by four foot square. He did not wait for the store to go broke. He looked at the four foot by four foot square, didn't matter what it was doing, if it wasn't making money, it was out and something else went in. I'm telling you, when you start looking at your businesses, don't wait for the farm to go broke. Either fix it or get out of one of these enterprises. And that's what will start to happen as margins start to get tighter. We've got to get better at enterprising. So, why does it matter? Well, because your herds, we keep relocating cows in quota. And every time we do that, we stack on more debt on farms. And you're growing at about 15% increase in herd size over the past 10 years when I pulled your data. I told you, interest rates can only go one direction. I've already proven to you, supply management doesn't insulate you from what's going on in the world. And yes, we are looking at mega tariff deals, or mega tariff reduction inside some of these trade negotiations. Those are real. So we just have to figure out how we're going to manage within it. Any questions to this point? Anybody want to go home? <laughs> we should have had a box of Kleenex on every table, Jeff. It's not bad news. It really isn't bad news. Just understand it and figure out how you're going to play within the rules now. So now this is where you want to go, and you were, by the way, correct. What are the key output variables? Once I've got my management aligned, and I've got everybody in the same organization, in my organization, pulling on the same end of the rope. Now what I'm going to measure that matters, and you already nailed them. Yeah, return over feed, you got them. Your milk and component, and component production, and how persistent those cows, cows are. I.e., after 150 days in milk, how quickly do they drop off? And I'll show you why that's important. Sure, health performance. Hey, you guys started nailing them. You've been doing enough. Reproductive performance. So what is the measure? 21-day preg risk rates, percent of heifers Pregnant by 15 months of age, you hear these numbers knocked around, that one's wrong. Why is that one wrong? Who breeds heifers based on age? When's a heifer ready to breed? Correct. 55% of mature body weight. It has nothing to do with her age. So how quickly we can get them to that 55% of mature body? Because I'm telling you, we throw a lot of money into heifers. We don't make any money until they calf. So optimizing that as a resource is pretty important. I'll show you some spreadsheets on it later on. Utter health is important. Shipping milk out the driveway. Lameness is a big issue on dairy farms. And I'm going to show you call rates here in a second. 
Involuntary culls, why cows leave farms. Now, if it's a voluntary cull, that's your decision. There's probably good sane business reasons why you're doing it. Involuntary culls are cows that you would have kept if you could have, but they ended up for lots of reasons I'll show you. And we have to know the economics of our herd replacement strategy. And there's lots of new technologies coming along, and you've got to be able to assess them. Now, you don't have to do it individually, but surround yourself with a team that can. And as labor goes on farm, labor efficiency becomes important. How many have hired labor? Yeah, I thought so. How many feel pretty good about it? No, seriously, maybe you do. And some people are doing really well. But there's a big variation between farms on how well they manage labor. So, where are we sit today? This is Ken West data from 2014, last published. And we can argue over some of these, but look at the difference in milk value. Between the top 10% and the bottom 20%, there's a huge difference. Utter health, huge difference. Average age at first calving, big difference. Where's the magic cutoff here? Does anybody want to know what the, in Holstein's now, where actually, it's actually worse to calve them over a certain age, and I'll tell you why here in a second. On average, heifers, Holsteins, have lower production if they calve over 27 months of age than they do under. There's a couple reasons for that. One is if they get fat deposition or adipose depo deposition in the udder, they won't milk as well. The second thing is they're far more likely to calve in with Staph aureus mastitis with higher age groups. So that's an important number to look at. Do you think it's a problem calving cows, calving first lactations? And this is an average. So if you hit that as an average, I'm going to tell you, you were calving some at 19 months of age. Is that a problem? And why would it be a problem? Correct. So you're right, which is back to that 55% mature body weight and how quickly you can get them there and get them bred and into the milking string. So one of the strategies, and we're going to talk a bit about that, is actually calving them. What's true about first lactation heifers on their milk curves? And what's their persistency like after 150 days in milk? Yeah, they're flat. So you can actually get them into the milking string and then with whole breeding again, if you can get them pregnant when you want and have them in the, in the positive revenue side versus the negative revenue side. These are not complex. Everybody in this room knew that answer. You just have to start thinking about how you're going to implement it on your farm. Uh, calving interval, well here's, and this was the debate. If I've got a high producing herd, actually is bringing calving interval down a good thing to do? Discuss. No, why? No, so there's a few things. Where are the two highest risk in a dairy animal's life? For death. I'll give, you, I'll give you the rules. For death. Where are they most likely to die? First 30 days or the first three weeks of life? Clearly, huge difference between those. The more times we put them through the first 30 days, the more risk we've got. If I could have cows milking, profitably for a long time, and that's why I talked to you, persistency is so important, I could maybe withhold breeding as long as, here's the golden rule, I can get them pregnant when I want to get them pregnant. The problem is if you miss that window and she goes on and now you end up with fat cows and they're high risk calving, now you got a mess. So you got to be able to get cows pregnant when you want to get them pregnant. And then efficiency, what percentage of my cows are in milk? And I'll give you a good example of this. This was a large farm post BSC. Wasn't in Alberta, so you won't know who it was, but they milked 600 cows. They were having financial trouble. They had recently expanded. BSC comes along and they're having financial trouble. So I went in there, I was asked to go in there and take a look at it. And, you know, so the first thing I saw is their fresh cow pen was full of sick cows. Now that's never a good idea. How many think it's a good idea to give less than a foot bunk space to sick cows? I'm telling you. Make a decision. I say get rid of these because they're going to die anyway. You're better off so that the rest can survive. And then we went out and looked at the dry cow barn. This is right after BSC. What happened post BSC to the dairy industry? Pardon? We had, you're right, Mike. Cow cow price tanked. And we make bad decisions sometimes. 
So what this farm do? We're not going to sell cows at low cost. We're going to keep them. We'll kick them out in the dry cow pen. Milking 600 cows, go out to the dry cows. We've got 300 cows with bulls running in there. Yeah, but you see what I mean? Like, you should know better. But those are the things that people, because cow crop price was down. It's just bad, bad decisions. Don't make the bad decisions. It happens. So, there's what it looks like. That's the game you're in for the milk. And now we're talking to milk cow herds. That's what it looks like. Your job is to play in the sweet spot. So you want to play where income overfeed is three to one. It's not always like that throughout lactation. They're individual economic units and they're different. So the shape of this curve on the downside becomes important and the space between here becomes really important. And I'm going to tell you, out here, you're losing money on those cows and you're losing money here. And you certainly are inputting money when they're dry. So playing the game in the sweet spot is fairly important. Now you see there's a little Excel sheet, but it's not on there. But that actually shows you how to do this within individual cows for monitoring them. So let's start quantifying the impact of some of these variables that you talked about. Let's not talk about what my involuntary call rate, let's talk about how many dollars that cost me. Because you can't make decisions without getting it back to an economic basis. So this data is older and I'm going to show you the new data. Doesn't matter. This is days in milk and this is one cow. This is Ken West DHIA's data and this is one cow's leave farm. This is everybody less than 60 days in milk. That's a 305 day and this is everybody that left after 390 days. Let's talk about this group first. What is this group? Less than 60 days in milk leaving a farm. Dead and dying cows. But you're right. They usually have mastitis. They got at least three events, but I'll, I'll show you that data. Who thinks that's a good business decision? Well, you got that one right. That's a bad business decision. I'm going to show you why here in a second, how much that costs you. What are these cows, 305s? Pardon? They could be low production. Some of those are actually voluntary calls where people wanted to finish their 305 day and then let them go. There's definitely, what do you think this whole bunch is out here? Yeah. There's a pile of cows out there, isn't there? Reproductive failures. So, behind this data set, there's a little thing called Cal Value Calculator. This is out of Dairy Comp 305, this data. Cal Value Calculator. Now, I could argue this is the value of putting a replacement heifer into the stall. I could argue all these that had less value than putting a more profitable animal in the stall, we could argue that's a good business decision. All these ones over here that had more value than a replacement heifer, bad business decision. Unfortunately, two-thirds of culls are in this zone, i.e. they have more value than actually putting a replacement heifer in their stall. And we need to manage it, so what's that mean? Well, you, that same data set, you coded why they left farm. So on average, you put them down as repro failures, and they had $210 more value than putting a heifer in their stall, i.e. it would have been well worthwhile. I'm not saying get cows pregnant at 300 days of milk, because they're high, high risk for calving when they come around. Domestic sales was another reason, but dead cows, $1,000 more value. Why is that? When do cows die? You've answered this before, yeah. Beginning of lactation, you invest that money, you don't reap that lactation, you lose a lot of money. They cost you a lot. And then utter health calls, which you had mentioned before, you're right, $528 more value than putting a heifer in there. So when I start quantifying this into dollars, and then I go ahead, here's the 2014 data from Canwest. 367,000 cows with accurate records on them for why they left. There was 55,000 of them culled, so 15% cull rates on farm across, on average. 31% were due to repro failures. 16% were due to low production. Most of those are repro failures. You just finally put down the shovel and stepped back from the hole and shipped her and marked her down as low production. Utter health was next. Sickness, those are those dead cows. And feet and legs. Once you start quantifying that, you should know what those are on your farm, which, why cows, cows leave, because it has a big economic impact. Dead and dying cows. So this is the risk of a cow leaving if she had no disease. I actually just showed you this is wrong. This was done earlier on. It was 18% cull rates. We are down to 15 right now. 
But if they have one disease, it doubles. Two diseases, it almost triples. And then by the time they get three diseases, which is what happens to transition cows, they're gone. And you lose big money. And so fresh cow, how you handle fresh cows is very critical on a farm for profitability. And that's what we tend to do. One thing happens, another thing happens, and then she's gone. We overload them and they're out the door. So what's that cost you? So this was put together by Chuck Gard at Cornell, and I know it's really busy, so I'll ask you only to, I'll let you understand how this works. So if a cow has a case of milk fever, and these are actually diagnosed cases, not subclinical uh, calcium depressions, death loss, how likely is she to die and what would that be? Well, yeah, the ones that go down never get up, they do die. Is there an increased risk if a cow had milk fever of her being called that lactation? Yep. Are there vet and drug costs? Are you going to discard milk while well, she gets up and get going? The answer is no, so zero here. Is she going to have trouble getting back in calf? Yep. Delayed conception. Lost production? Yep. Total disease cost, whoop, back up here, is $333 for a case of milk fever. LIR is lactational incidence rate. And this is on average, and this is an Ontario data set, so I don't know what it is, 7% of cows were identified as having clinical ketosis, or clinical milk fever. Ketosis is down here, that's clinical ketosis. This is how often it happens. Multiply that times that, and that's my disease risk cost. Average farm, every time a cow goes through calving, is at risk of $570 per cow. How many think that's good? Be an average here. It's a lot of money, $570 every time a cow calves. What does good look like? So the top 10 percentile in that same data set, they got it down to 60, you don't get it to zero, but they got it down to $65 a cow. There was almost $500 per cow difference just in transition cow management alone. Now what could I do with $500 a cow? And if you quantified that, and you would know, I've used these spreadsheets to build transition cow barns. Because 500 bucks a cow will buy a lot of facility. If that's what the problem is, and I give you an example. 1,400 cow dairy, again, not, not in Alberta. 1,400 cow dairy built a brand new milking facility because the old barn was a hell hole. And they put the dry cows and the transition cows in the old barn. And they had trouble. But they're all in. Put all their money in. What do you do now? I can't borrow any more money and I'm in trouble. What do I do? We actually talked the bank into lending them the money because we built a good business plan about how we could fix this and built a new transition cow barn. So never say no. Good plans get good things done at financial institutions. Good plans. <laughs> good plans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, write that down. But you can, you can do these kind of things. Moving along, who thinks that having a, a NEFAs, do you know what I mean when I put NEFAs up here? Not a sterified fatty acids, okay? So a, a measure of ketosis in dairy cows. I.e., she was losing weight fast post-calving and picked it up as a NEFA. This is three days postpartum. Who thinks that has an impact on reproductive performance? Yeah, big time, there's the numbers. Just look at NEFAs outside of here and look at what your probability of pregnancy at first service is. They just drop off dramatically and everybody says, gee, I wish my first service conception rates were higher. I'm telling you, go back and manage your transition cows. You'll get there. What's the value of changing your 21 preg rates? How many know what their 21-day preg risk rate is? You should. I'm sure you do. It's been talked about enough. Yeah. What is it? Mike, what's yours now? Well, yeah. Okay. Mike, you're right over here. You can take the rest of the day off. <laughs> it is. I'm telling you. If that's where you are, and this is what understanding, should you focus your management efforts there now? The answer is no. Keep it there, but start to move on to something else. Unfortunately, where's the average in the CanWest data? What's the average? Yeah, it's, up, it's almost 15 now, but it's 14 or 15. <laughs> that's $66 per cow to move every point. Do you think that's worth your management attention? You're darn right it is. So if you know what that is, then you can start managing around it. I'm going to put up heifer rearing cost because it's an area of lost opportunity on a lot of farms. I'd start by saying, what do you think the proper economy of scale is around a heifer rearing operation? 
Anybody want to take a shot at it? There's been some work done on this. How big do you need to be to get efficiencies around heifer rear? How many think they're big enough to drive the efficiencies inside a heifer rearing operation? No, you're right. None of us are. Because it's probably around 1,500 heifers that where the economics start to make sense, and we don't. And what I'm telling you is we start looking to the future. Maybe we've got to look at doing other ways. What I'm telling you today is assess where you are today and understand how much money you're investing. So on average, I just put this in there. They're very costly under 60 days of age, and they get very costly just before calving. Why are they costly right in here? Good answer. Right one, too. Yeah. And then we start investing in them and free fresh rations, whether that's immunization, CRC boluses, whatever that is, we invest in them back here. Mortality rates on average are still running 12.5% less than pre-weaning, 2.5% post-weaning, and that's going to cost you 16 cents a day. But I'm going to give you another bad, bad number here pretty soon. So then I've got an initial value. What's a drop calf worth now? It's probably not worth 450 because milk price globally is. What can you get for heifer calves at two weeks of age right now? on the open market. Is anybody not even selling them? Should we be considering it though? If I'm going to invest this kind of money, is that the right economic decision? How many think all heifers are created equal? How do you make decisions on who stays and who goes? What do you do now? They all stay? You, are you using genomics? No. Nope. But you can. Now, how many are you using parent averages? If you've got pedigrees, you can use parent averages. How accurate are parent averages? 70? Correct answer over here at 30, not 70. A lot of variability on using parent averages. So, yes, you can, and we're going to have to start thinking about and adopting technologies to know whether that's the right thing. Yeah, genomics will double it. You'll get up to about 65% average based on genomics. Genetics, fall, everything in life falls into bell curves. We only care about the very top. Again, if you're going to run genomics and make no management decisions, don't bother doing it. But if you're going to do it to find the top and do something different with your top end, or you're going to do something different with the bottom end, now you're making decisions, then I'm okay with it. But I'd have to run the economics. They've become pretty cheap, though, to run genomics. So, if I like to make money on my assets, which I told you, asset utilization is important, and my cash cost of production, I use 45 cents, but I think you showed me lots of people are running at 48. Doesn't matter. How much milk do I have to ship if I'm going to pay 38,500 and put these economics in to get back to break even? Well, there's some math for you. 22,000 liters to get back to zero. That just gets my investment back. So how far along are we? How many lactations are we in now? What happens, and this happens in herds, where they've got a 10 to 15% cull rate on first lactation animals in the first 60 days of milk? Everybody left has to pick up their costs and carry it on, and this number gets astronomical. So it's a pretty good number to look at. Because here's what we do. I showed you the production curve, but here's life as a dairy cow. We invest, we invest, we invest, we calve them out, we make some money back with milk, we dry them off, we, we put money back in, we get again, and we go on. Now this was put together, this is in the U.S., this was done by Ferguson and Gallison at Penn State, and it's U.S. It's actually, this, you can regain in our system, because of our, if you can control your variable cost, you can gain your money back. You actually don't have to get all the way out here to get back to ground zero. They're saying in the U.S. you had to get six lactations. How many things that happened? Never happens. Now, you do have a residual value, so this is a net present value. So if I could cull a cow for $1,000, I'm back out even here. But I'm just even. Who's in this game to break even? So it's important to track that. And there is first lactation milk. That's four years of every two-year-old in CanWest data set, four years data, as we look at their lifetime milk today versus where their two-year-old production was. And I'm telling you, if she doesn't start well as a two-year-old, she will not give you lifetime milk. You couldn't draw a better graph. I didn't put the p-value on there. They're so straight. They're highly correlated. You've got to make sure you get out of their way and allow them to perform as a two-year-old. 
or they will leave. So, we could go on a long time, but let's open it up for some questions. Any questions? You're a very quiet group. Yes? Mm -hmm. And then later on the presentation, you showed the graph of how Ted was and the, the, the economics. economics of that. So having that curve with Ted, obviously more power than having more offense. But the trick is this. You bring up an excellent point, and I'm glad you did because I have an answer for it. The trick is, is getting cows pregnant when we want to get them pregnant. Now, if you look at Ken West, you know how dairy comp set up. After 60 days of milk, she's called eligible to get pregnant. That may not be right on all farms. Maybe on if I've got a highly persistent herd and I'm drying cows off at 38 liters of milk, maybe that's not the smartest thing to do in those herds. Maybe I, what I should be doing, or I should be classifying my animals within there. Maybe my two-year-olds, I want to hold off till 100 days of milk. But once I make the decision to make, get her pregnant, I want to get her pregnant within three weeks. And that's the truest definition. You can't just simply go by, and that data set that's put up there on Ken West, that's based on getting pregnant after 60 days of milk. And that's not true for all herds. You're right. But we want to get them pregnant when we want to get them pregnant. So the, the push over the last five, ten years has been getting people to get pregnant. And maybe the evolution of the calf is successful again because of... Mm -mm. Yeah, see? But, Mike, you did the right thing. You said, for my herd, I extended out there, and now I'm counting from day 70 on. And you should set that based on your herd. Why 21-day preg risk rates? You should adjust that number. You can do that inside Dairy Comp. Eh? You can set your voluntary wait period and then calculate your numbers going forward. You should set it for your herd, not an average. So if that's 70 on your herd or if that's 90 on your first lactation heifers, that's fine. But then in the next 21 days, I want to get them pregnant because I want them to calve when I want them to calve. So how do you make that decision to bump that? You have to know your records. So take a look at your, just graph out your two-year-olds, for example, and see how flat they are after 150 days in milk and when you're calving them and what you're drying them off at. And do it by category. Yeah, if their milk production's high. So where's, where's, what's break even on milk production? In Alberta right now. Jeff, you don't get to answer. What, what is it? How much milk do you need to do to break even? Should know it. Which, Mike? Yeah, it's actually jumped because of returns on quota. It's 24 now. Did I hit it? It's a little different in Ontario. It's pretty close to 24 here. Lower quota price in Ontario, mind you, lower quota price comes with bad things. You can't get quota in Ontario, so let's forget that, but it changes it a little bit. But it, so if it's 24 liters, but w what's the risk categorization for new other health infections? Where's the break point? At dry off, how much milk production at dry off to increase the risk of getting a new environmental infection during the dry period? No, it's 22. So, but we're drying lots of cows off at 34 liters and maybe increasing their risk for new other health infections because of it. So there's lots of strategies around that. But if we did that, and I understood my break-evens were at 24, but understanding back here, boom, 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 boom. This, your income over feed starts to decline though, so be careful. Even though break-even's here, nobody plays the game to break-even, understand what that is. If this curve flattens out like this though, you can calculate these. If anybody's interested, there's a little spreadsheet for calculating them for your farm. You can calculate them and then make good decisions. If you don't know what it is, it's hard to make good decisions. But you're right about pregnancy rates and calving intervals. Any other questions? We look like we're in shock. 
And it is a lot to take in. And I mean, that's why you surround yourself with a team. You know, you're, you're pretty fortunate if you're working with a group from Nutrisource. They look at life this way. They're really good at helping people. Monitor. I'm not just saying that because you paid for me, and by the way, you didn't. <laughs> but it is. So you got to surround yourself with good advisors on, on where you're going. Thanks very much, Jeff. I enjoyed it. Yeah, that was great.